It's 1986, the year where Gorbachev took the whole world into his sight. Not just Europe, but Asia too. Success followed disaster, and disaster followed success. It sounds like science fiction, space weapons, nuclear disasters, an astrologer dictating the schedule of the world's most powerful person. But it all really happened in 1986. Gorbachev began the year with a bang. On the 14th of January, he proposed on his own initiative, in a letter to Reagan, that there should be no more nuclear weapons on Earth by the end of 1999. By giving a fixed date for elimination, Gorbachev's proposal went beyond all previous generalities and outlined a timescale that would proceed in three stages. The first phase would last between five and eight years, where the US and the Soviet Union would reduce by half their long-range nuclear weapons, those capable of reaching each other's territories, while agreeing not to conduct any nuclear tests. This was premised on the basis of the mutual renunciation of the development, testing and deployment of attack space weapons. This, we know, Reagan was unwilling to do. Gorbachev went further. The second phase would start no later than 1990 and last five to seven years, bringing Britain, France and China into the nuclear disarmament process and produce agreement on the elimination of their medium range and tactical nuclear weapons. Finally, Gorbachev finished with a third stage to begin no later than 1995 to eliminate all remaining nuclear weapons with an agreement signed by every country on earth that these weapons shall never be resurrected again. The next day, Gorbachev went public with the proposal, no more nuclear weapons by the year 2000. It wasn't just Gorbachev. The chief of the Soviet general staff, Marshal Sergei Akromeyev, was a prime mover in the initiative. Even the very top of the Soviet military, from Akromeyev to General Viktor Starodubov, had been convinced of the dangers of thousands of strategic missiles with tens of thousands of warheads that were standing on trigger alert and of their capacity to incinerate all life on Earth within 10 minutes. Reagan was, however, genuinely tempted by at least a few parts of the offer. He had an idealistic streak in him also and refused to officially dismiss Gorbachev's proposal as a publicity stunt. But that was a minority view in Reagan's administration as a whole. For the Defense Department, it was especially unwelcome. Richard Pearl quickly dismissed them all as a total delusion. Mitterrand in France concurred and Margaret Thatcher called them pie in the sky. Thatcher said to Pearl, it is inconceivable that the Soviets would turn over their last nuclear weapon. They would cheat. I." would cheat. On the 11th of February, Reagan went ahead with a spy exchange between both countries, because of which Weinberger critiqued Reagan and Schultz for supposedly falling for Soviet propaganda. The CIA director, Bill Casey, and his deputy, Bob Gates, said that Gorbachev had done nothing new, offered nothing, that the Soviets hadn't changed, that it was all a ploy. Reagan's advisers knew how to get Reagan's ear. They're trying to ruin your space weapons project, they would tell him, knowing his project would never work in practice. As for Thatcher in Britain, she was angry at Gorbachev, as he had previously said that Britain and France would be left out of the agreement. They were left out of the first agreement, as Gorbachev promised, but the fact they were included in a later agreement for a world without nuclear weapons infuriated Thatcher. She joined the Hawks, whispering in Reagan's ear. Gorbachev was clearly a more astute operator than his predecessors, she told Reagan, but beneath the veneer, he was the same kind of dedicated Soviet communist that we have known in the past, relentless in pursuing Soviet interests. 
she wasn't just contradicting the facts, but her own words of a year earlier. Luckily, the British Foreign Secretary Geoffrey Howe showed a greater responsiveness to Gorbachev. Peter Craddock, in a memorandum to his colleague Charles Powell, observed of a Foreign Office paper that it identified so many legitimate Soviet concerns that we appear on more than one occasion to be acting as Soviet apologists. Americans like Schultz and Roseanne Ridgway also recognised the change Gorbachev represented. We used to be able to count on their stodgy bureaucracy, Ridgway remarked to Schultz, but now I think we have the stodgy bureaucracy. Reagan countered Gorbachev by returning the conversation to Afghanistan. He swore to Gorbachev that the United States would have no desire or intent to exploit a Soviet military withdrawal from Afghanistan to the detriment of Soviet interests. This was yet another lie. The United States continued to back Islamist fighters in Afghanistan, supplying them with advanced weaponry. It had been a long-term policy of the United States, pioneered by Zbigniew Brzezinski during the Carter administration. There was no consideration of what forces they might unleash by arming the most intolerant and extremist brands of Islamism. It created huge problems in the Soviet withdrawal, but Gorbachev continued ahead with it, unabated. And when the Soviets did leave, the American supported Mujahideen morphed into the West despising Taliban and turn their sights now on the United States. The next month, Gorbachev discussed Reagan's SDI obsession with his team. Shevardnadze, Dobrinin, Yakovlev, Medvedev, Chernyayev, and KGB chairman Chebrikov. Soviet intelligence had come to an important conclusion. Reagan's space weapons project was unfeasible. It would take as little as 10% of the costs of the American program for the Soviets to counter it. The military technology expert Bill Perry knew the Soviets were correct. The Soviets, he wrote, could deploy thousands of decoys with their warheads, thereby multiplying the number of targets the SDI must deal with, a huge problem of target discrimination. And the Soviets could build more missiles and warheads at a much lower cost than SDI. So even if we never deployed the SDI system, simply starting it could precipitate a new and more dangerous phase of the nuclear arms race. This was great news, some of Gorbachev's military experts told him. Gorbachev should no longer consider SDI a problem, but on the contrary, perhaps they should encourage the Americans to continue the ridiculous project. Gorbachev was horrified by such talk. It cannot be emphasized enough that Gorbachev did not want the Soviets to win the Cold War. He wanted to end the Cold War. He didn't want to win the arms race, he wanted to stop the arms race. Besides, Gorbachev correctly argued, if the Americans were allowed to go ahead with their space weapons project, it would be in breach of the existing ABM treaty between the two countries. And that may produce further technological spin-offs that could spin the arms race further out of control. But most important to Gorbachev was the principle. The SDI project raised serious doubts on whether the Reagan administration shared his belief on the necessity of reversing rather than accelerating the arms race. Peace, Gorbachev told his team, was the highest of all values. In the nuclear age, World War had become an absolute evil. The nuclear arms race must be halted, even though the United States, which was the locomotive of militarism, wished to keep it going to prevent the Soviets from switching expenditure to civilian needs. In the previous video, we discussed Gorbachev's new team for reform. Unlike Brezhnev, who promoted acolytes with whom he had formed good relations when he was their party boss in Ukraine, Kazakhstan and Moldova, Gorbachev did not advance any of his subordinates from Stavropol. He admirably avoided nepotism and cliques. But the negatives of this was that sometimes he promoted those 
who were not distinguished either by their commitment to far-reaching reform or by their personal loyalty. The exception was in foreign policy, where Gorbachev succeeded on both counts. The International Department was generally considered by Western Sovietologists to be a bastion of ideological conformism, and the same scholars tended also to exaggerate its dominance over Soviet foreign policy. In reality, no other institution provided as many recruits for Gorbachev's team of advisors. And now that their diaries have been translated, it has become clear that they long held iconoclastic views. The International Department had become a major oasis of enlightened thinking in the Soviet nomenclature. It provided Gorbachev with people on whom he could rely for new ideas and honest estimates of the situation after coming to power. It began with Anatoly Chernyaev, whom Gorbachev chose as his foreign policy advisor that March. Every bold foreign policy initiative advanced by Gorbachev bears Chernyaev's mark on it. Born into a cultured intelligentsia family with some aristocratic antecedents, including a general Chernyaev who served in Tsar Alexander II's army, Chernyaev fought in the Red Army during the Second World War and became a Communist Party member in 1942. After the war, he became a contemporary history teacher at Moscow State University when Gorbachev and Raisa were there. Afterwards, he worked in Prague, as so many others in Gorbachev's entourage did. On the eve of the 27th Party Congress, Alexander Yakovlev was not in formal terms of any rank at all. He was neither one of the 319 full members of the Central Committee, nor one of the 151 candidate members. But by the end of the Congress, thanks to Gorbachev's backing, Yakovlev had become a secretary of the Central Committee, a position which led to his jointly overseeing ideology along with Yegor Ligachev. Guided by Yakovlev, the ideology department created a new section on human rights. Another Gorbachev ally, Vadim Medvedev, less radically reformist than Yakovlev, but closer to his position than to Ligachev's, likewise became a secretary and was put in charge of its socialist country's department, which supervised relations with the rest of the communist world. Medvedev replaced an older and more hidebound party official, Konstantin Rusakov, who already in failing health died later that year. Academics, especially those who worked in policy research institutes, had never in Russian history been as politically influential as they became in the second half of the 1980s. By the first anniversary of Gorbachev's leadership, he was able to take control of Soviet foreign policy in a way in which he could not determine the country's economic policy. But his radical reformers were restless. Exceptionally daring in words and how he evaluates the situation, Chernyaev noted of Gorbachev, but cautious in action. Yakovlev wrote an astonishing memorandum proposing that the party abandon its sacred leading role and divide into two competing movements, socialist and national democratic. Yakovlev also suggested workers' control in industry and a genuinely independent judiciary. Stalin would have had him shot for it. Now Gorbachev merely commented, too early, too soon. When we took the first steps with Perestroika, Medvedev wrote later, we tried to change the economic situation with more well-known methods, strengthening discipline and order, improving management techniques. Later we saw that we needed to go deeper. Nevertheless, Gorbachev's speech at the Congress contained new emphases that few in the West picked up. The only security worthy of the name is mutual security, he argued, and the Soviet goal should be to keep down the military potential of states to a reasonable sufficiency, there not being a need to match the other side weapon for weapon. Gorbachev noted the American president's contention that if our planet was threatened by another planet, the USSR and the USA would quickly find a common language. But then, as if replying to Reagan's favourite quip, 
He added, did not nuclear catastrophe and the great ecological threat constitute more real and present dangers than the arrival of mysterious extraterrestrials? Joris Medvedev thought him a talented orator, stating that Gorbachev is probably the best speaker there has been in the top party echelons since Leon Trotsky. Medvedev also considered Gorbachev a charismatic leader, something Brezhnev, Andropov and Chernyenko had not been. But if charisma was nothing more than a demeanour, then that award belonged to Gorbachev's loudest critic, Yeltsin, who had been sniping at Gorbachev in Politburo meetings. That February, Yeltsin had become a candidate member of the Politburo. At that point, he formally left the Secretariat to concentrate on his role in Moscow. Over the coming year, he removed many older secretaries, replacing them with younger individuals, particularly with backgrounds in factory management. At the Congress, Yeltsin called for more far-reaching reforms than Gorbachev was initiating and criticised the party leadership, although did not cite Gorbachev by name, but claimed that a new cult of personality was forming. Yeltsin was suggesting that Gorbachev's replacement of almost half the old guard was about Gorbachev building his own personality cult, even though it was that very process that had allowed Yeltsin to rise. Despite this, when Yeltsin gave a two-hour report to the party conference in August, in which he talked about Moscow's problems, including issues that had previously not been spoken about publicly, Gorbachev described the speech as a strong, fresh wind for the party. Yeltsin was, at the end of the day, a reformer, and the country needed reforms. When push came to shove, Gorbachev believed Yeltsin would put aside his objections and rally to his side. Gorbachev, for better or worse, often disagreed with the members of his team, like Rijkov and Ligachev, who he saw as too hardline, and Chernyayev, who he saw as wanting to go too fast in reform. But Gorbachev never imagined that anyone in his team would put themselves before their country. Things were becoming difficult. Within months of Gorbachev's coming to power, the world price of oil, which financed most of the Soviet Union's hard currency earnings, dropped by two thirds. Gorbachev wanted East European states to start paying for oil and gas imports in hard currency instead of benefiting from massive Soviet subsidies. Gorbachev told their leaders to reform because as with its policy over Poland in 1981, the Kremlin would no longer intervene militarily to protect them from internal rebellions. Oil exports were a bulwark of Brezhnevism, but they turned into the Soviet Union's Achilles heel. In 1986, world oil prices dropped from close to $30 a barrel to less than 10, leading to serious problems for the Kremlin's finances. Gorbachev's government was forced to borrow heavily in order to import food and industrial investment shrank, which further depressed output. This spiral of debt was an important factor in the escalating economic crisis of the USSR's final years. It's an interesting irony that the vagaries of a capitalist commodity market should have contributed to communism's ultimate downfall. Of course, as will prove a trend, with the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the situation got worse still. Oil output slumped drastically from a peak of 570 million tonnes the following year to a low of 303 million in 1996, a 47% drop. And in April, an event would occur that shook the belief of the Brezhnev era old guard to its core and seemed to confirm everything Gorbachev had been saying about the stagnation of the old system. On the 26th of April, 1986, the number four reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power station exploded, causing radioactive contamination to spread 
especially in Belarus and parts of Ukraine, before being carried by wind northwestwards. During the February Congress, the Soviet Minister of Energy, Anatoly Mayorets, had just promised to double the number of Soviet nuclear reactors and to build them in record time. In the immediate aftermath, officials fed Gorbachev incorrect information to downplay the incident. The Ukrainian government told Gorbachev that there had been an explosion and a fire at Chernobyl, but that the reactor was intact. The head of the Soviet nuclear program, Yefim Slavsky, didn't understand the scale of the problem. Gorbachev had replaced most of the old guard. He had even been critiqued by Yeltsin for that very reason for building a personality cult. But it seemed Gorbachev had not replaced enough. Slavsky was 88 years old. On the morning of the 28th of April, the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Sweden detected high radiation levels emanating from Ukraine. Meanwhile, at an emergency meeting of the Politburo, Richkov said that a radioactive cloud had reached the Lithuanian capital Vilnius the previous day. Gorbachev and Yakovlev were the first to stress the need for an early public statement about the accident. The next day, there was a report in the New York Times and a briefing from the CIA announcing the worst nuclear accident in history. As the scale of the disaster became apparent, 336,000 people were evacuated from the area. A 30 kilometer exclusion zone was imposed around the site and the Central Committee ordered helicopter airdrops to cover the exploded reactor with sand, lead, clay and boron to quell the activity in the reactor. By mid-November, the Soviets had mobilized 200,000 workers to build a 400,000 ton structure encasing the reactor building in a concrete sarcophagus. Several days after it occurred, Gorbachev gave a televised report to the nation. The nuclear industry, he said, was dominated by servility, bootlicking, cliquishness and persecution of those who think differently. Neither the civil defence nor the medical services had been prepared, he said, and people simply did not know what to do. Weddings in nearby towns went ahead and children were playing on the streets, oblivious to the hidden menace of the high levels of radiation. He accused the Ministry of Atomic Power as being a law unto itself, keeping information away from the Central Committee. As a result, we have suffered huge losses, not only economic but also human. He announced that the first deputy minister responsible for the sector, Alexander Meshkov, was now fired from his post for his extreme irresponsibility. Putting Slavsky into a belated retirement, Ryshkov and Ligachov were sent to the most affected areas, meeting with officials and the courageous workers who were successfully containing the disaster. The Ukrainian Ryshkov made a good impression, but not so much for Ligachov, who was fought insensitive when he told a local Ukrainian, well, it's certainly a great misfortune, but we'll learn from your experience. It was insensitive. But it was also true. Gorbachev went on to use the Chernobyl tragedy as an argument against cosy personal relations, narrow departmentalism, the persecution of critics and whistleblowers and excessive secrecy. Chernobyl had really opened my eyes, he said later. From then on, no scheme for transforming Soviet reality was too revolutionary or wild for him to discuss with his growing team of supporters. From April to the end of the year, Gorbachev became increasingly open in his criticism of the Soviet system, including food production, state bureaucracy, the military draft, and the large size of the prison population. First, Gorbachev turned to the economy. Ryshkov carried out the policy of an increase in the quantity and quality of goods planned for production during the period of the 12th Five-Year Plan of the Soviet Union. To achieve these goals, 
the government pumped money into the machine building sector. But as time went by, Gorbachev increasingly diverged from his original stance. He now wanted to increase overall investment in nearly all industrial sectors, a move which Rishkov knew was a budgetary impossibility. In the mold of Andropov before him, Rishkov wanted to specifically focus on increasing the production of consumer goods. Gorbachev, in contrast, was willing to countenance many reforms at once. In April, he introduced an agrarian reform which linked salaries to output and allowed collective farms to sell 30% of their produce directly to shops or cooperatives rather than giving it all to the state for distribution. In a September speech, he embraced the idea of reintroducing market economics to the country alongside limited private enterprise, citing Lenin's new economic policy as a precedent. He nevertheless stressed that he did not regard this as a return to capitalism. Gorbachev also began working on regaining trust in Europe after Chernobyl. Even before the disaster, Gorbachev had told a meeting of foreign ministry officials that domestic Soviet identity should be considered a foreign policy issue. After Chernobyl, he told the Politburo, it is now necessary to expand further the battle for the liquidation and complete prohibition of nuclear weapons and to actively conduct our peace offensive. Many leaders in both camps had dangerously pre-nuclear notions of the world at a time when 30,000 nuclear warheads were sitting in storages on both sides. He argued that the development of democracy and respect for human rights at home would inspire trust for the Soviet Union abroad. By May, understanding that the Reagan administration were not as desperate for peace as he had fought, he told these same officials that the most important direction of Soviet foreign policy should now be European and that therefore the foreign ministry was too Americanized. Reporting back after a meeting with Margaret Thatcher, Gorbachev told his colleagues that what she most wanted to know was what the USSR was like today. He said that West European leaders he met had said to him, you have no democracy. Let's say we trust you personally, but if you are gone tomorrow, then what? Without democracy, we will never achieve real trust in Soviet foreign policy abroad. There was truth in this advice, but it also misled Gorbachev. Did the West really believe that if democracy came to the Soviet Union and Gorbachev was replaced, that he would necessarily be replaced by someone also as interested in peace? as he was. Surely the signs were there, though many chose not to see them, that if democracy was introduced during the unfolding economic crisis, that the people might elect someone who was less likely to compromise with those in the West who had shown themselves to be anti-Soviet at all costs. Nevertheless, the new Soviet identity treated public opinion in the West as real and as partly the product of the Soviet Union's own foreign policy errors. There was no more room for errors, Gorbachev argued. He had made his choice to trust the West. It was naive, but it was not just that. He saw always the shadow of war creep upon him. In just one rocket, he said, there lurks a hundred Chernobyls. So Gorbachev was not just focused on America, but increasingly on Europe. Usually in the West, that is where the story stays. In Russia too, he is taught as someone who made peace with the West at all costs. But actually, Gorbachev wasn't just focused on Europe. He had bigger plans. It was at this juncture Gorbachev turned East. By the mid-1980s, the Soviet Pacific Fleet had around 800 ships, compared to the 230 American vessels stationed in the Pacific Ocean. Yet, the US Navy was not the only rival about which the Soviet Union worried. In 
encouraged by Washington, Japan had rearmed, becoming a substantial military power. Tokyo established a de facto cap on defense spending of 1% of GDP. But as Japan's economy boomed over the course of the Cold War, Japan's military budget grew too. On top of that, China and the Soviet Union had engaged in border skirmishes for years. But even after the death of the erratic Mao Zedong, Soviet hardliners obstructed efforts to improve ties with China or to restrain military deployments in the Far East. Eduard Shevardnadze later estimated that confrontation with China cost us 200 billion rubles. The Soviets had long supported Vietnam against Chinese encroachments, but as the Chinese economic success became more apparent, more Soviet academics suggested that a multipolar strategy would produce better foreign policy results. Georgi Arbatov advised Soviet leaders that peace with the Chinese should be promoted, and that the USSR could reinvigorate relations with Japan. Alexander Yakovlev called for new steps in developing relations with Japan and China. He declared that it was time for unorthodox approaches and doing away with old stereotypes. The class enemy, he wrote, is a partner in solving global problems on the basis of mutual interest. That capitalism was likely to persist for an indefinite duration, making peaceful coexistence not a sort of respite, but the only possible way of existence. Yakovlev revealed himself as a foreign relations idealist. Security in the present day world can be genuine only if it is universal and equal, he said. Nothing should be done that could be regarded by the other side as a growing threat to its security. The context of this is not just the easing of tension in the Cold War, but the general rise of Asia, the trend we continue to see in our own time. East Asian technology had reached parity with American, and all of the East Asian countries spent a greater share of GDP than the US on research and development. The Soviets were impressed and overwhelmed by the success of Japan's economic miracle, driven by high-tech manufacturing, cheaper production prices, and better management practices. One by one, the Asian tigers started exporting textiles and footwear, adopting new technology and entering new markets. Soviet scholars read influential books such as Chalmers Johnson's MITI and The Japanese Miracle, and Ezra Vogel's Japan as number one. A Soviet journal translated the concluding chapter of Paul Kennedy's Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, which asked whether the United States was falling behind relative to Japan. The answer, many Soviet analysts believed, was yes. And not only Japan, but increasingly China, another communist state. That Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong could rise under the military protection of the US could be processed by the Soviets. That communist China could rise following a similar path to Japan was more embarrassing. The Pacific region has become the center of world development, Yevgeny Primakov observed. The Soviet defense industrial complex consumed an estimated 15% of GDP, and it would need to increase if it was to keep up with the Japanese, the Chinese, and the billions that Reagan was spending on the US Navy and putting weapons in space. The usual story of Gorbachev revolves solely around his attempts to improve relations with the West, but nothing could contain his vision. Gorbachev also wanted to improve relations with the East at the same time. There was, after all, no guarantee that Western leaders would see it in their interests to put the Cold War to an end. All Gorbachev's advisers agreed that Reagan's anti-communism was so ideological that it may prove a stopping point to all negotiation. But his advisers also all agreed that Japan was not particularly militaristic, nor did China really want to claim Soviet territory. In the summer of 1986, 
Gorbachev's second year of power, he travelled to the far eastern city of Vladivostok to explain his vision. Brezhnev, in comparison, had not visited the Soviet Far East until his 14th year of power. Everything is in movement on this continent, Gorbachev proclaimed. Civilization is moving toward the Pacific Ocean. We are also moving in Siberia, in the Soviet Far East. There is an objective interest in questions about Asia-Pacific cooperation. The Asian Pacific region is one of our most important orientations. To mark his visit to Vladivostok, Gorbachev prepared a speech that would outline a new policy of engagement with Asia, offer an olive branch to all the neighbours that Soviet militarization had frightened, and propose initiatives to connect the USSR to Asia's fast-growing economies. His message to Asia was clear. From now on, he proclaimed, the Soviet Union will be one of the greatest Asian powers. Why not cooperate? Gorbachev asked in his speech. Some of the major problems of cooperation are literally knocking at our door. I am not inclined to believe that the military-industrial complex is omnipotent. The question of withdrawing a large part of the Soviet troops in Mongolia is being considered, he promised. The two divisions of the Soviet army in Mongolia are not saving the USSR, he told the Politburo. Better to bring them home and reach out the hand of friendship. Gorbachev's top policy aides celebrated diversity within the socialist community. The time when such diversity was viewed with dogmatic, sectarian suspicion is now past, Vadim Medvedev argued. Deputy Foreign Minister Anatoly Adamishin declared that injecting ideology into foreign policy was dangerous because it is the direct path to foisting one's views, scale of values and ideals, and hence one step to the imposition of one's conviction by force. China served as a laboratory for reformed socialism, one Soviet scholar said. Another Soviet analyst recounted looking at China's reforms as if they were our own personal business. At the time, a Soviet journalist walked the streets of Moscow and asked what ideas came to mind upon mention of China. They thought of the Great Wall and China's capital, Beijing. They named well-known Chinese goods. But almost every one of those questioned mentioned the word reform. The old disputes began to melt away. The Sino-Soviet split had encouraged India to lean on the USSR, and Gorbachev did not want to squander this friendship. A new Prime Minister, Rajiv Gandhi, came to power in India in 1984. Like Gorbachev, Gandhi was seen as representing an energetic new generation of political leaders. It is just amazing how much we have in common, Gandhi told Gorbachev when he came to New Delhi in November. Like all his Soviet predecessors, the Soviets showered India with aid and military equipment, but made it clear that he was not going to support India for or against China. Instead, he proposed an all-Asia forum for security matters, that the USSR, India and China could work together as an Asian triangle. We cannot say aloud the word ally with regard to India, but we should take matters in that direction, Gorbachev told the Politburo after his visit. Even the policy with Korea now began to change. In 1984, the Soviets had improved their relations with North Korea, and Kim Il-sung made his first visit to Moscow in 17 years. When Gorbachev came to power, he decided to tread a careful line between reassuring the North Koreans that they were against American military buildup in South Korea, while also maintaining the potential for opening relations with the South for the first time. Moscow had become a hostage to Pyongyang, Soviet official Karen Brutens put it, fearing to establish normal relations with Seoul. That May, the Politburo agreed that South Korea was not simply a tool of Washington, but a factor of global military strategic balance. Seoul was seen as a promising business partner, especially after South Korea became more democratic 
after the establishment of the Sixth Republic in 1987. And this diplomacy was advanced further the following year, when the Kremlin decided to send athletes to the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul. When North Korean diplomats complained to pro-perestroika journalist Alexander Bovin about his critical articles, Bovin told them to go to hell. Not the attitude the North Koreans had previously encountered. Meanwhile, domestically, glasnost was the word of the day. Glasnost meant greater openness and candour in government affairs and for an interplay of different and sometimes conflicting views in political debates, in the press and in Soviet culture. Encouraging reformers into prominent media positions, Gorbachev brought in Sergei Zaligin as head of Novi Mir magazine and Yegor Yakovlev as editor-in-chief of Moscow News. He made the historian Yuri Afanasyev Dean of the State Historical Archive Faculty, from where Afanasyev could press for the opening of secret archives and the reassessment of Soviet history. Gorbachev saw Glasnost as a necessary measure to ensure perestroika by alerting the Soviet populace to the nature of the country's problems in the hope that they would support his efforts to fix them. Particularly popular among the Soviet intelligentsia, who became key Gorbachev supporters, Glasnost boosted his domestic popularity, but alarmed many Communist Party hardliners. For many Soviet citizens, this newfound level of freedom of speech and press, and its accompanying revelations about the country's past, was exciting for the young, but uncomfortable for most. Theatres and film unions supported Gorbachev rapidly and energetically. Between 1986 and 1988, the number of theatres in Moscow increased by 50%. This in a city that already had more cultural institutions than almost all others. And amateur and semi-professional groups multiplied, including fringe companies offering more experimental productions. In a parallel process, members of the Cinematographers' Union voted out two-thirds of the board in May 1986, electing in their stead uncompromised directors most of whom had entered the industry in the 1960s, like Yelum Klimov, Elda Shingalea, and Andrei Smirnov. Cinema studios converted to a financially self-supporting system that permitted virtual autonomy over script selection, budgeting, casting, and hiring. In 1988, film studios gained the right to distribute their libraries of films directly, bypassing the official government export agency. Almost immediately, the Cinematographers Union undertook a review of films suppressed during the Brezhnev years, mainly for political transgressions, and authorised their release. They included Gleb Pamphilov's The Theme, finished in 1979 with allusions to Jewish emigration, and Alexander Askoldov's first and only film, The Commissar, from 1968, with an ambiguous Red Army heroine a montage reminiscent of the 1920s, and a flash-forward to the Holocaust. Audiences watched these recovered films with interest, but reserved their passion for the new movies portraying the Soviet Union's painful past and its tumultuous present, just as they devoured investigative journalism in print and on TV. All Union television, reaching virtually every household in the nation, broadcast a startling number of documentary films. A few directors, like Kira Muratova, Alexander Sukurov, and Lana Gogoberidze, welcomed Glasnost as the chance to make films that resist the over-politicization of culture, rather than as an opportunity to make more openly political films. But the majority of filmmakers, freed from the demand to construct the future, portrayed the reality that surrounded them, the deteriorating economic situation. Feature films like Vasily Pichul's hyper-realistic melodrama Little Vera and Yuri Mamin's satiric The Fountain 
drew huge audiences, 50 million for Little Vera, and international prizes. During the Gorbachev years, editors reintegrated into Russian culture an extraordinary range of once-banned material, from poetry and fiction written in the 1920s, such as Yevgeny Zamyatin's 1920 dystopian novel We, to novels written 30 or 40 years later, like Vasily Grossman's Forever Flowing, or the novels of Vladimir Nabokov, from Samizdat texts by authors living abroad, to texts written for the draw by Soviet authors who had simply waited until circumstances changed. Contemporary authors who had published throughout the years of stagnation now took up crusading pens. Notable examples were Valentin Rasputin's Fire, Viktor Astafiev's Sad Detective, and Chinggis Aitmatov's Executioner's Block. Chinggis Aitmatov, you'll remember, was Gorbachev's favourite contemporary author. Works also appeared by Tatyana Tolstaya, Viktor Yerofeyev, Mikhail Kuraev, writers whose vision of the world evolved prior to Glasnost, even if the publication of their works did not. In addition, readers had access to a bewildering array of pulp fiction, thrillers, romances, pornography, lying cheek by jowl with political pamphlets and serious literature on the stalls outside metro stations. But as the period of Gorbachev's rule drew to an end, writers and critics gradually abandoned the time-honoured civic and social role of literature, its functional utility. Artists began to focus simply on their art and not on the political message. Gorbachev hoped they would rally to his side. He had given them not just the freedom to publish, but also the freedom to divest themselves of social responsibility. Meanwhile, relations were deteriorating with the Americans. George Shultz, who always believed Gorbachev was the real deal, despaired over the ideological anti-Sovietism of the Defense Department and the CIA. Most notably, Defense Secretary Weinberger, Bill Casey and Pat Buchanan. The CIA's top Soviet expert, Robert Gates, was still insisting Gorbachev was just another in the succession of hidebound Soviet leaders. Paul Neitz, Reagan's special advisor on arms control, was so obsessed with the modernization of the US nuclear arsenal that he was even against proposing the elimination of mainly Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles because he feared that Congress would be unlikely to fund a new generation of missiles if there was a risk of them being banned by a treaty with Gorbachev. The Americans then announced their decision no longer to abide by the salt limits that had kept the precarious arms race stable. It got worse. The Americans gave the order to arrest Gennady Zaharov, a Soviet employee in the United Nations, for trying to recruit an American defense contractor who was actually working for the FBI. The Soviets retaliated, as usual, by arresting Nicholas Danilov, who was accused of the same. The Americans insisted Danilov was innocent. He was but he had been used as a plaything by the CIA and been caught in the web of their creation. Danilov had once, without knowing, delivered an envelope to the American embassy that had been written by the CIA, and the KGB had recorded a conversation in which a CIA agent lied that Danilov was a friend. In other words, CIA incompetence and bad luck had got Danilov arrested in return for the arrest of Zaharov. Gorbachev insistently moved to resolve the conflict. Shevardnadze and Schultz, both sick of such intrigues, quickly did so, exchanging the Soviet dissident physicist Yuri Orlov for Zaharov and freeing Danilov. But Reagan was not happy to leave it there. He had been told that Danilov was badly treated, so they decided to expel Soviet officials upon his return. As usual, 
the Soviets reciprocated one for one. Another summit looked further away than ever. Schultz grew tired and offered his resignation. It was the third time he did so, and for the third time Reagan refused to accept it. Shevardnadze and Schultz had been clever though. In return for Danilov, Schultz had promised a future meeting. From his Crimean vacation at the end of August, Gorbachev told Chernyayev to propose to Reagan to meet as soon as possible in London or Reykjavik in Iceland. Why Reykjavik? Chernyayev asked. Halfway between us and them, Gorbachev responded, and none of the big powers will be offended. The entire world, Gorbachev addressed Reagan, was expecting us to have a really productive and fruitful second meeting. That is why an idea has come to my mind to suggest to you that in the very near future and setting aside all other matters, we have a quick one-on-one -on -one meeting. Shevardnadze delivered the letter by hand and Schultz urged Reagan to accept. The Americans agreed one week before the summit commenced on the 11th of October. The impetus to make a breakthrough came more from Gorbachev than the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in general. Gorbachev and Chernyayev agreed that reducing and then liquidating strategic arms with a 50% cut in the first instance should be the main goal, and reduction should not be made conditional on an agreement on space weapons. Emphasizing the importance of getting rid of all intermediate range nuclear weapons in Europe, Gorbachev said everyone understood that a hundred missiles were enough to destroy all of Europe and a large part of the Soviet Union. The head of the KGB, Chebrikov, protested to Gorbachev not to make the concession to remove all their intermediate range nuclear weapons. Gorbachev faced him down, telling Chebrikov that by solving these problems we will not weaken our security, but rather strengthen it. Overall, however, Gorbachev got the Politburo and the Soviet military behind him. Although few in the West understood at the time, the Soviet military had proven more willing to disarm than the American military. Gorbachev invited the chief of the general staff, Akramayev, to come to Reykjavik with him. Among the positions they agreed was a readiness to cut by 50% their heavy intercontinental ballistic missiles, the only weapons the Soviets possessed that the Americans could not match. This was therefore a major concession by the Soviet side. On the 11th of October, Gorbachev arrived in Reykjavik with Akramayev, Shevardnadze, Yakovlev, Dobrynin, Chernyayev, and of course, his wife, Raisa. The Americans weren't nearly as prepared so their group was smaller than the Soviets. Reagan's wife Nancy's contribution would be less than it was for Geneva. It extended no further than Nancy's usual consultation with her astrologer on what would be the most auspicious day for her husband to depart for Reykjavik, and was told that this would be 9th of October, two days before the meeting was due to begin. And so it happened. But Nancy didn't join her husband. She thought Reykjavik would be a business meeting and wives were not invited. When Nancy heard that Raisa had gone anyway, she was furious. It's one-upmanship. I'm being jerked around, Nancy said. Raisa is testing me to see if I would cave in and change my mind. Nancy watched on television Raisa meeting with children, making a good impression on the media. She stole the show touring schools and hot springs. An interviewer asked Raisa where she thought Nancy was. Perhaps she had something else to do. Or maybe she isn't feeling well. Raisa said she had read two novels by Iceland's Nobel Prize winning novelist Haldor Laxness and added that she really preferred to learn about the country first hand. Perhaps Raisa was not quite as oblivious with her relations with Nancy as she pretended to be. This was her chance to steal the limelight, and she took it. <laughs>
She was asked if she and her husband were not uncomfortable staying on a Russian cruise ship when the weather has been dreadful. She smiled and said, No, I do not mind. It's very romantic. When she gave a museum a gift of a book about Prince Igor, an Icelandic reporter asked if it was the same Prince Igor as the character in the opera of the same name, because it was the reporter's favourite. Raisa stopped her tour to give the woman a detailed account of the plot of the opera, based on the 12th century work of literature about the campaign of Prince Igor of Kiev. She was asked later in the day if she missed Mrs. Reagan. She shrugged. I can't answer that because I don't know why she isn't here. She visited students who had sent letters to both the American and Soviet leaders about stopping the arms race. Gorbachev had answered them. Reagan had not. I believe that the discussions between the two will make the world safer for the young, Raisa said. The Soviets outlined their position. Schultz later complained how Reykjavik had exposed how poor the quality of our intelligence was about the Soviet Union. The CIA message about what to expect in Reykjavik was exactly contrary to what transpired, he wrote. Moreover, Akramayev's opposite number had been left in the United States. It was an ironic moment in world history. The head of the world's most powerful military was willing to make concessions to the head of the world's other most powerful military, and the latter didn't come. Akramayev played an impressive role. An American hardliner, Ken Edelman, even said he was responsible for an arms control breakthrough that could not have happened with any other Soviet official in that center seat. He was incorrect. The vast majority of Soviet military officials were willing to make the concessions necessary to de-escalate the arms race. The same could not be said for the American military. Even more importantly, Akramayev outlined their new defense doctrine to the rest of the Soviet military in the months that followed the meeting. Many responded with incomprehension, disbelief and alarm but Akramayev defended Gorbachev's line competently. Thus far, Gorbachev had not only kept the Soviet military on side, but got them behind supporting complete nuclear disarmament. For the Soviet Union to exclude British and French nuclear weapons from the INF negotiations was a major concession. It had been a prime aim of the British government to make sure that they could not be negotiated away. The Soviet military had always counted together the total weapons in Western Europe, whereas the Americans insisted they matched Soviet weapons alone. For this reason, the Soviets always perceived the combined Western force to be greater, and therefore that the impetus for disarmament should come from the West but the West believed that it was the Soviets that had upset the balance. No progress had therefore been made, even under Andropov. When Gorbachev changed the Soviet position on British and French nuclear weapons, he was doing something that was almost certainly necessary to obtain an INF agreement, but he was putting at risk his standing with the Soviet military. Like in Geneva, the talks reached a standstill when they touched upon Reagan's space weapons project. Reagan yet again promised Gorbachev to share the technology. For Gorbachev, it was like negotiating about the existence of unicorns. You don't, Gorbachev told Reagan, want to share even petroleum equipment, automatic machine tools, or equipment for dairies. Sharing SDI would be a second American revolution, he told Reagan, and revolutions do not occur all that often. Gorbachev had come to Reykjavik ready to make substantial concessions for the sake of a far-reaching agreement that would dramatically diminish the danger of war, whether by design or by accident, and enable the Soviet Union to reduce the size of its excessive defense budget. This, the concessions that Akramayev was authorized to unveil at the meeting of military experts, were highly attractive to the American side. The interim agreement reached was for equal ceilings with a limit 
of 1,600 launchers and 6,000 warheads. That was more than enough to make life uninhabitable in either superpower. The Soviet concession was predicated on American acceptance of a 10-year period of non-withdrawal from the ABM Treaty, during which work on SDI would be confined to the laboratory. As the American saying goes, Gorbachev said to Reagan, it takes two to tango, and it takes two to control arms, two to reduce and eliminate nuclear weapons. Our national interests will not be preserved if we retreat from consideration of the interest of the other side. But Reagan continued with platitudes, defending his SDI project. He listened to Reagan's usual opinions about how space weapons would actually bring about world peace, that it would protect against nuclear missiles. With that logic, Gorbachev asked, couldn't the US launch a first strike and then use the new defences to prevent retaliation? If Reagan was indeed determined, as he said, to have a deterrent and see that there is never a nuclear war, he failed to see that SDI marked a rejection of deterrence, a fundamental change in strategy that the Soviets could only perceive as a threat. With its promise of invulnerability from nuclear attack or counterattack, SDI made an American first strike seem plausible, even probable, to the Russians. Free of the fear of retaliation, Americans could indulge the fantasy of a winnable nuclear war. Gorbachev grew frustrated with Reagan's platitudes. Yes, yes, I've heard all about gas masks and maniacs probably ten times already, but it still does not convince me, he remonstrated. Still, having made significant concessions, Gorbachev was prepared to stay longer in order to clinch an agreement, provided the Americans made the required compromise on SDI. And it was Reagan who called a halt to the meeting. Believe it or not, our session has come to the end, Reagan announced, and suggested handling over the difficult issues to their experts. Gorbachev stayed seated. This is the kind of porridge we've eaten for years, he said. Gorbachev could have called Reagan's bluff on sharing the SDI program. He could have asked Reagan to sign a public declaration that he would do so, and then let him face the fire back in Washington. But that's not how Gorbachev fought. Politics wasn't a game for him. Politics was the last step to avoid war. He laid out his final offer. No withdrawal from the ABM treaty for 10 years. No SDI testing outside laboratories. A 50% cut in strategic offensive weapons by the end of 1991. Liquidation of the remaining such weapons by 1996. They wrangled between them, and Gorbachev showed himself willing to negotiate on some of his points. Reagan asked Gorbachev whether he was saying that beginning in the first five-year period and then going on in the second, we would be reducing all nuclear weapons, cruise missiles, battlefield weapons, sub-launched and the like. Going entirely off script, Reagan said suddenly, it would be fine if we eliminated all nuclear weapons. Gorbachev paused a moment, listened, and then said, we can do that. We can eliminate them all. Schultz, who was supposed to have stayed silent, couldn't help himself. Let's do it, he said. Space weapons got in the way. SDI scuppered everything. The American right wing is kicking my brains out, Reagan complained. You're three steps away from becoming a great president, Gorbachev told him. If we can settle our differences, your critics would not open their mouths. The whole world would cheer. Reagan begged Gorbachev to allow him his space weapons. I could not return to Moscow, Gorbachev said, if he allowed the testing of weapons in space. I would be called a fool and not a leader. As they walked out, dejected, Reagan told Gorbachev, I still feel we can find a deal. I don't think you wanted a deal, Gorbachev replied. I don't know what more I could have done. 
For a few hours, an amazed world had watched its two most powerful leaders design a future in which there would be no nuclear weapons at all. Gorbachev was devastated. He had believed they would make a breakthrough and he had promised the Politburo that if Reagan rejected his concessions, he would condemn the president as the main obstacle to world peace. He entered the Opera House to thousands of journalists who rose and stood anxiously awaiting the result. I felt as if they represented the whole human race waiting for their fate to be decided. Gorbachev made a decision. He couldn't break off the peace talks by insulting Reagan as much as he wanted to. He outlined instead to the world the proposals he had made and he outlined Reagan's rejection. But he hailed the result, the fact that they had almost reached agreement. Human rights became a subject of productive discussion for the first time. Gorbachev had agreed for the first time to on-site inspections, a continuing American demand which had not been achieved in the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963 or the ABM and Salt One Pacts of 1972. For all its drama, Reykjavik wasn't a defeat, but a breakthrough, he said. When the cameras shifted to an applauding Raisa, gazing at her husband with joy and tears streaming down her face, it was another media victory. Reykjavik expanded the pale. It brought the idea of abolishing nuclear weapons into the realm of mainstream political discourse. It created the prospect that the most destructive weapons of the Cold War might not survive its end. A media victory, but not a political one. Gorbachev returned home to criticism. For Politburo member and future president of Azerbaijan, Haydar Aliyev, the summit had unmasked the United States. Gromyko said that they needed to write more about SDI, exposing the idea that it was a shield. Chebrikov, the head of the KGB, declared what he had learned from the summit, and many ordinary Soviet citizens agreed. The Americans understand only strength. Bolden said Gorbachev had let the Americans play with him as a cat does with a mouse, and what else could be expected, he continued, from a man with a peasant upbringing who wanted to become a great diplomat. Generally, however, Reagan's critics didn't oppose Gorbachev. After all, Gorbachev had told the Politburo exactly what he thought of Reagan. Gorbachev described Reagan to them as a class opponent who displayed extreme primitivism, a caveman cast of mind and intellectual feebleness. He couldn't even look me in the eye at the end of the summit, he told them all. But, he finished, success was near and it would have had vast significance. There's no need for haste. But during the coming months, Reagan retreated even from his Reykjavik position. Akramayev's American equivalent was now getting involved to tell Reagan that zero ballistic missiles would pose high risks to the security of the nation. Reagan had tried to request a study of what would be involved in sharing SDI with Gorbachev, but the bureaucracy didn't allow the request to go anywhere. Within large sections of the political and defence establishments of Washington and London, there was much more concern that the leaders had actually come close to agreement on the elimination of nuclear weapons than about the ultimate breakdown of the talks. Most of all, it filled Margaret Thatcher with horror. Its failure was the only good thing about it, she said. My own reaction when I heard how far the Americans had been prepared to go was as if there had been an earthquake beneath my feet. Thatcher hated the idea of Britain losing its nuclear weapons. She feared that the elimination of ballistic missiles would undercut her domestic political position since the British Labour Party at that time was in favour of the UK giving up its nuclear weapons and removing all US nuclear missiles from British soil. At party conference a few days earlier, Thatcher had rhetorically asked, 
Does anyone imagine that Mr. Gorbachev would be prepared to talk at all if the West had already disarmed? How now would the Conservative government sell the expensive Trident nuclear submarine program, the cornerstone of its defence policy, to the British people if the Americans were talking about doing away with nuclear weapons altogether? In a meeting with Schultz, Thatcher threatened that without advanced consultation next time with the British before any agreement to get rid of ballistic missiles, it would cause you to lose me and the British nation. The British had finally found the backbone to stand up to the Americans on an issue they cared about deeply, the illusion of their independence. The French President Mitterrand was hardly softer. All of Western Europe seemed to agree that Reagan had narrowly avoided falling into a Russian trap, which would have led to American abandonment within 10 years of their entire strategic deterrent. The West German leader, Helmut Kohl, however, took the crown. He is a modern communist leader, Kohl said, describing Gorbachev, who knows something about public relations. Goebbels, one of those responsible for the crimes of the Hitler era, was an expert in public relations too. It was an absurd comment made by the leader of a country who had not only elected the Nazis, but whose West German government had contained many ex-Nazis and those linked to the Nazis in the post-war world. For Kohl to compare the leader of the Soviet Union, the country that had been the main force in defeating the Nazis and had suffered the most casualties, to a Nazi, was nonsense at the worst of times. It was the surest way of alienating the peoples of the Soviet Union away from peaceful coexistence. For Kohl to compare Gorbachev specifically to Goebbels after the Reykjavik summit will rank as one of the most irresponsible comments in history. Gorbachev had long loved the West. He had a passion for Europe. He deeply admired Britain, France and Germany it must have seemed like it was all being thrown back in his face. A different leader may have stopped negotiations at this point and got the support of his people by pointing to the hypocrisy of foreign leaders and, it must be said, the casual hatred of many of their people to those they simply called the Russians. Not Gorbachev. Needless to say, he calmed down in a few days and got back to work. The internal democratic politics of the Western democracies proved to be more gripping concerns than stopping the arms race or nuclear disarmament. The Republican Party lost control of the Senate in the congressional elections, and the Iran-Contra scandal broke, where it was exposed that the US had secretly been buying Iranian arms for the Nicaraguan far-right Contras to use against the leftist Sandinista government. It was a scandal, not because they were arming terrorists, but because the weapons came from Iran, whose government many American hawks hated as much as Nicaragua. Reagan's priority, as clear from the Geneva Conference in the previous video, was anti-communism at all costs. And this made Gorbachev's concessions even more impressive and harder to swallow for many in the Soviet Union. Matlock recalls how there was no longer any interest in moving on arms reduction, only in containing the political fallout of Iran-Contra. The scandal led to the resignation of the National Security Advisor, John Poindexter, who had supported Reagan's limited negotiations at Reykjavik, but then encouraged Reagan not to enter any conversation about eliminating all nuclear weapons. He was replaced with the even more hardline Frank Carlucci, who continued the attempt to harden Reagan's position to Gorbachev. He knew Margaret Thatcher was his secret weapon. I finally said, Carlucci recalled, if you move to get rid of nuclear weapons, Margaret will be on the phone in five minutes. Oh, I don't want that, Reagan replied. What does America want 
Gorbachev seethed at a Politburo meeting in October. They're perverting, revising Reykjavik, backing away from it. They were speaking garbage in mothballs. And even at this point, at this level of exasperation, Gorbachev made another concession. He was ready, he announced, to let SDI testing take place outside laboratories, in the air, at test sites on the ground, but not in space. He compromised. Shevardnadze was sent to tell the Americans the new offer. The Americans, even Schultz, replied they did not want to talk about it. After Schultz and Shevardnadze met in Vienna with no progress achieved, Gorbachev became worried. The Soviet people wanted progress. Soviet generals were sputtering that the leadership was disarming the country. We mustn't allow it to appear as if we're not getting anywhere, he told Chernyayev. But we can't just chase after shit. And that was how the year ended. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. Time is working for us, Gorbachev had told the Politburo. But time works for no man. Gorbachev had everything. Popularity domestically and abroad. A vision and a plan. A generally talented and intelligent team. And a drive to change everything. North and south, east and west in his country and the world. He had everything. Everything except time. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate everyone who has taken the time to watch every video in my series so far. Let's discuss things further in the comments. Please like the video and share with friends and family. Next time we're moving on to 1987. I'm looking forward to seeing you then.